why they're more skeptical than the modelers are is because a lot of the modelers are not meteorologists. They're physicists that came from other disciplines that think in terms of very, that think, they think about the climate system in very simple terms. And you all know how complex clouds can be, right? And in fact, clouds are central to my message tonight. Okay. But the question is, what evidence supports having sensitivity or high, high sensitivity in these climate, climate models? What, what evidence is there that they are dominated by positive, or that the mother nature is dominated by positive feedbacks? Uh, one thing that Jim Hansen looks at, and Jim Hansen is going around the country uh, now, and it, he's probably the most alarmist. He's, he's on the other end of the spectrum from me. He, he works for NASA and has, has been doing climate modeling as long as anyone in the business. And uh, he goes according to the geologic record or the ice core record. And I thought this was the most effective part of Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, was where he had this huge stage prop on the stage showing what is uh, thought to be 500,000 years, close to 500,000 years from the Antarctic ice core from Vostok Station of variability in temperature over hundreds of thousands of years, variability in carbon dioxide over hundreds of thousands of years. And obviously the two go up and down together, right? And then Al Gore is up here on this man lift. There he is, right up there. Uh, so here's the historic record of CO2 from the ice core. And look where we've got it now. And here's where it will be later this century. And the implication is clear. You know, if CO2 and temperature go up and down together, then we're in big trouble. I mean, if, if that's really what's going to happen here, we're screwed already, <laughs> you know. Uh, except that what Al, Al Gore doesn't tell you is that he is assuming that a certain causation, a certain causative mechanism is going on here whereby carbon dioxide increases lead to temperature increases because that's what we've got going today. Global warming theory is that the CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere will cause warming, okay? Well, it turns out that all of the people that work in this field, uh-oh, clean the air filter. All of the, let's just ignore that big square thing in the middle. Uh, the people that work in this know that the temperature and carbon dioxide uh, have on average an 800 year time lag between the two with the temperatures occurring before the carbon dioxide changes. I think whatever ha happened in global climate, if indeed this is some sort of index of global climate since it's, it is at the South Pole, uh, whatever happened, I don't think we got a clue what caused the temperature changes that then resulted in the carbon dioxide changes. But we know that carbon dioxide on Earth is part of a natural carbon cycle. Like I mentioned, it's, you know, it's part of life on Earth. In fact, we see during El Nino and La Nina events, you've heard of El Nino, tropical sea surface temperatures in the Pacific get unusually warm. When El Nino happens, a whole bunch of extra CO2 is pumped into the atmosphere, approximately equal to what we pump into the atmosphere in one year. And then during a La Nina, it's the opposite. In other words, nature doesn't naturally, isn't naturally always in balance with the CO2 going in and out of the surface. There are warm and cool years and changes in ocean circulation that cause there to be imbalances that are always changing. Uh, but anyway, I don't think we can use this record, even though Jim Hansen relies on it. Uh, I don't think we should use this record as an argument for what causes what, especially with the time lag that's involved. You know, the causation appears to be in the wrong direction. Uh, my view is that we should be analyzing how the climate system behaves today and how sensitive it is, what the feedbacks are uh, in the climate system today. And what we're going to find out is feedbacks are related to the question of whether something else might be causing global warming other than mankind. You see, there's, there's this tight connection between feedbacks and CO, the CO2 argument. Because if the climate system is sensitive, if the feedbacks are positive, then the CO2 we put in the atmosphere is sufficient to explain the warming we've seen. If the system is sensitive, that means it doesn't take much of a push to cause it to warm. Okay. 
If the climate system is insensitive, if the feedbacks are negative, that means the CO2 we've pumped into the atmosphere isn't nearly enough to cause the warming we've seen in the last hundred years. And there must be some sort of physical mechanism at work. And that's what I'm going to show you evidence of. Well, to figure out this how sensitive is the climate system question, we measure feedbacks from satellite data. I'm not the first one to do this. It's been done by other people for years using different satellite data sets. This is what I spend most of my time in now, is both observationally and based on theory, understanding what Mother Nature is telling us about feedbacks. What we do is we look at year-to-year -year climate variability, whether it's El Nino and La Nina, or some years are just warmer than other years. And, for instance, during a warm year, how do the clouds change? You know, are there fewer clouds? Are there more clouds? And we try to back out what the feedbacks are from that behavior. Okay? Uh, this is the Aqua satellite that we launched in 2002. I'm the lead scientist on this uh, hood ornament up here. This thing spins and it measures all kinds of things on the Earth's surface. It measures Arctic sea ice, uh, sea surface temperatures, even through clouds. It measures rainfall over the ocean. It measures wind speed at the surface of the ocean. All kinds of stuff. Very versatile instrument. Satellite also has a number of other instruments that measure cloud properties, for instance, and also measure the radiant flows of energy in and out of the Earth. Now, this is key. Global warming is all about this energy imbalance we've got on the Earth because we're pumping CO2 into it. There's two kinds of energy flows going in and out of the Earth. Sunlight, you're all familiar with, right? That's the source. But you may not know that for all the sunlight that's coming in, on average, there's an equal amount of infrared radiation escaping to space. The temperature remains constant if the amount of energy coming in equals the amount of energy going out. It's the same thing, as, and I've never used this before, but I'm going to try it tonight. <laughs> You heat a pot of water on the stove. But I'm going to tell you, the pot of water does not heat up because you're pumping heat into it from the stove. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. What happens if you put the stove on low, the water heats up, but eventually, well, eventually, after 10 minutes, let's say, the water stops heating up. You're still pumping heat into it from the stove, let's say if you put it on low, uh, with a gas stove, let's say, so it's always on, doesn't switch on and off, on and off, on and off. You're still pumping heat into it, but the temperature stops going up. And the reason is because temperature doesn't change based on how much heat you put into it or take out of it. It has to do with the balance between energy going in and energy going out. The, the water stops warming up at the point at which the amount of energy absorbed from the stove equals the amount of energy lost to the, to the surroundings from the pot of water. So it's, a, it's an energy balance question, and it's, this is like the pot of water. And what we've done, the extra CO2 keeps some of the infrared from escaping, traps more of it in the lower atmosphere, okay? It's kind of like putting a lid on the pot of water, but not that dramatic. The pot of water will heat up more with the lid on it, but eventually it'll settle out at a new temperature, a new warmer temperature, exactly the same thing in terms of energetics. Okay, what we do with these satellite instruments is we measure, we measure these different flows of energy in and out of the Earth. We measure cloud variations. Uh, we measure surface temperature variations. And like I said, we're trying to figure out how does the climate system respond when Mother Nature is causing climate variability. You know, we're, we're looking for clues. Well, what I did and this is work that has just been submitted for publication. I took our five years of good NASA satellite data, our most recent data, most accurate, and computed how the reflection from clouds changed, averaged over the Earth, okay? Depending on temperature. So for instance, when it warmed up, did the reflection from clouds increase, which would be a negative feedback, or the other way? Well, all of the climate models, this is feedback down here. Okay, this, this here is, this axis is feedback. Over here is negative feedback to the, to the right of the line, to the left of the line is positive feedback. Now with the satellite data, 
All we have is one five-year period to analyze. And this is the number I got out of it for a feedback parameter. This is for infrared, by the way. Red, red line means infrared. <laughs> uh, the, the satellite measured this, but out of these 18 climate models, you know, you can run a climate model forever. Uh, 